Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Intel's new 56-core CPU, Alienware's Area 51M is out. How good is a 10-year-old power supply and some gorgeous PC cases from Be Quiet and Sentry? All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 511, recorded on April 4th, 2019. Intel's 56 core CPU and a couple of gorgeous cases. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used devices. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show. The name is bringing you hardware news. What a shock. Desktops, laptops, mobile, internet of stuff, consoles. We get excited about it all. Today, we are going from deep with inside your computer to the very edge of space and beyond. It is a big episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, and I am joined, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton, by the way, being joined by Sebastian Peake, PC Purr's EIC and mad benchmarker around town. Sir. Uh, yes, Patrick. That was quite the <laughs> intro. I'm trying to take it all in. Uh, See, I've your been name. benchmarking, and you have been surrounding yourself on all sides with headphones, apparently, for the last week. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've also been playing around with some high speed NICs. We'll talk about that next week or the week after. And I've also been benchmarking NASAs, which is always fraught. And then there was networking devices. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, performance testing, it's got to be done. It's got to be done, people. The, uh, <laughs> I was laughing. The, I, I, I really want to talk about this. Technically, not a hardware, uh, uh, a, a hardware story, but something that impacts most of us dramatically, especially if you have uh, hardware that is finicky. Uh, is our friends at Microsoft have decided? Well, let me read this line because this this line really caught me uh, from uh, Mike Fortin, corporate vice corporate vice president of Windows. Uh, Mike Fortin's gentleman's name. While regular updates are critical to keeping modern devices secure and running smoothly in a diverse and dynamic ecosystem, we have heard clear feedback that the Windows update process itself can be disruptive, particularly that Windows users would like more control over when updates happen. Today, we are excited to announce significant changes in the Windows update process, changes designed to improve the experience, put the user in more control, and improve the quality of Windows updates. Um, I like that they've heard clear feedback. <laughs> yeah, I, that sounds suspiciously like they actually have heard some feedback. We have course. decided to remove the subroutine that engages the stress monitor in your device to make sure that Windows reboots at the worst possible moment while adding in an update that takes in excess of 35 minutes when you are on deadline or desperately trying to close a business deal. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, God forbid you decide to pull the plug because you just have to have your system right now. Let's just restart it, restart it, and then it starts over again. And From the beginning. Yeah, there's there's no way out. You just stare at a screen that says 32% complete for how long? It's, uh, I was, uh, it, it, it's interesting to read this uh, because they point out, like, in previous Windows 10 update rollouts, the update installation was automatically initiated on a device once our data gave us confidence that device would have a great update experience. And uh, now they're going to basically let you know an update is available and that it's recommended. Uh, and then you can kind of, you know, choose, unless unless Windows 10 is at the end of service, um, it's going to, you know, be like, hey, you, you should install this and you can actually pause updates for up to 35 days and then, you know, choose a day or be forced in at, at the end of 35 days uh, to to install all of the desperately needed updates that you've refused. Because, you know, 35 days is interesting because it's a little longer than the Tuesday major security update cycle. Um, you know, the first Tuesday of the month, although they're not as hewing as tightly to that as they were in the past. But having been 
you know, ripsawed a few times um, with updates happening when I desperately needed them to not happen. Uh, uh, I think this is good. But it's also, you know, they're doing a download and install now options. They're all, again, adding up to 35 days, seven days at a time, up to five times. So it's not perfect. You can't be like, bother me in a month, uh, but you can delay it a week at a time, up to five times. Um, you know, they are now, um, the, it's interesting because they're now actually, you could manually set Intel or active hours when you would allow uh, Windows 10 to do its thing uh, update wise. Yeah. But now, uh, uh, Windows Update can, quote, intelligently adjust active hours based on their device-specific usage patterns. So if you've never opened up Windows and you find it, you know, installing updates at 2 in the morning because your peak productivity as a hacker or a nerd or a writer or whatever you are is between midnight and 6 a.m., uh, it will notice that, hey, he always works on the computer between midnight and 6 a.m., but at 8 a.m., he's not doing a thing. Um, so this is good. And then, of course, there's a call out to expanded focus on quality. So, <laughs> in any whatever case. that means. But hey, yeah. you know, they, they're working well, on the things and the, the buzzwords, and it, it all sounds very good. Of yeah. course, this is well, not giving you 100% control, which we last saw with Windows 8.1. They're still going to be pushing some things out. You're not going to be getting the big, you know, some semi-annual feature updates automatically you actually have to opt into that i'm sure those are still going to be pushing the quality updates down but like like you'd mentioned with the active hours that's big because i'm sure most people have never gone in and actually changed that power users may be but your average user it's stuck on 8 a.m to 5 p.m for everybody and so you yeah. start using your computer in the evening and boom it starts to update because well it's outside of your active hours because you've never changed them so the the intelligent feature there is, is a good idea it's uh i mean a big thing when they're starting talking about uh increasing quality is is one of the uh things they point out is they have millions of people submitting feedback to windows 10 and pointing out problems or or asking for features and one of the things they want to do is there may be issues that impact tiny subsect subsection sub a subgroup small group tiny group within uh the windows user base but it's absolutely brutal whatever uh is happening to their installations so they're talking about uh detecting and escalating the response to high severity issues uh that are low volume um and also they they've redone the dashboard uh to make it easier to find out what's going on you know uh, Quote, we will be launching a new Windows release health dashboard later this month that will empower users with near real-time information on the current rollout status and known issues uh, open and resolved across both feature and monthly updates. So I think, I mean, you know, anything that gives us more information, I think, is a positive thing. So Control of Windows updates. That's, uh, I'll vote for whoever has that platform in the next election. There should be a plug-in for that. So somebody should do an open source mod that controls the updates, like adding the Windows button back into the early version of Windows 8 in the lower left hand corner. You know, you know funny that you mention uh, open source mods. Uh, you know, there's different ways of controlling web traffic in your house and different things you can do, like open w uh, open WDRT. Am I getting this right? Oh, there's open mm -hmm. DNS, uh, which is the DNS you know service. I had been using right. Google's DNS for a long time. I used open DNS long ago. And as my son gets older, I'm thinking maybe I should control what he can access more easily in the house. Like my wife and I can set up filters. But one of the things I had sort of thought about was maybe setting up a blacklist of domains coming from a certain company that would prevent Windows Update from running in my house unless I explicitly removed those domains. And you know what? It worked. So I do have total control over my Windows 10 experience right now. <laughs> but not in, a, not in a very safe or recommended way. <laughs> What's the worst case scenario? You miss a critical security update and your entire system gets wasted. Ah, it's ah. fine. <laughs> uh, Be Quiet dropped an exciting... Is, what, what, okay, it's the Dark Bay 700 White Edition case. Is the White Edition new or is the Dark Bay 700, which also which happens to be available in White, new? Because this is a... This is an interesting use of LEDs. It's like ground effects so lighting, but on the side. Yeah. And be quiet if you're not familiar with the brand. They basically offer every color 
that you could imagine as long as it's black. It's like the old Ford right. Model T. And they're a German company. They're extremely conservative about design choices. They've never done any kind of ostentatious designs, really. They've done one previous white edition case of the Dark Base 900, which I had forgotten about. That was two years mm -hmm. ago. This is the white edition. The Dark Base 700 is a fairly new case. It's not brand new. This version of it is. And this white edition is limited to just 3,000 units that they produced. Whoa. And it's currently the only white case you can get from them. But mm -hmm. I, I love just it's it's very tastefully done. And you mentioned that RGB lighting. It is it has kind of a high end look. It's only around the very edges of that front panel that wraps down below the side panel on either side. And you can the word subtle that, comes to mind. Yes. I think that's the word I used. It and you can sync it up with your motherboard's lighting. So that's what I did. Everything was purple in the picture mm -hmm. that you're seeing watching the video. But just overall, very sophisticated kind of take on a white mid tower. We've seen a few of these, and it's a popular thing to do. You differentiate a little bit by offering a white version of a case, and white really helps show off RGB lighting, especially inside, because you have so much more reflecting back out through a clear side panel. But mm -hmm. this case was on display. I went to the Be Quiet suite at CES this year, and I walked in, and over on a coffee table over by a window was this case sitting there, pretty much set up the way that I recreated at home for this review. And immediately I was struck by a couple of things. One, I loved that that strip of lighting around the side. It looks kind of like a neon right. bar. And two, the glass side panel of this thing is, and it's kind of ridiculous to talk about how clear glass is, but most mm -hmm. computer cases have really, really dark tinted tempered glass when they have a side panel window. So this is like, completely clear and you can barely tell there's a panel on it at all in any of the pictures that I took because it's just there's no tinting at all so it does and definitely also help there's no well. was it not refining mean, is there some sort of like non-reflective coating on it or do you just actually turn once you turn to the point where there was no glare from the lights in the room the glass just kind of magically disappeared yeah, that was it. Because I could, I could wow. get reflections. It, you really, you have to have a lens with no filters on it at all. Sure. And I use a polarizer on my camera, which does cut down on reflections a lot. But you know, to the naked eye, it looks just like it did in these photos. We don't see any reflections off of it. Nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's another interesting thing about it. It doesn't look like it would be aluminum. It's it's like a hybrid. It's aluminum on the top and front. Steel frame, tempered glass side panel. The back, the back side panel is steel, so it's it's kind of a mix of everything. Early. And like any be quiet case, this is one of those that's built for silence. It's got the the panels of a, a noise damping material on the top, in the front, and on the back side panel. So basically, everything you'd expect from a be quiet case, except this one just happens to be white, and it happens to have a <laughs> tasteful implementation of RGB on it. But if if you go through the review, uh, you'll see all the little touches that make this stand out as, as far as I'm concerned. And I've, I've reviewed a lot of cases in the last five years. And basically every single point that I would like hit, things like a slide out tray to mount your top mounted radiator or fans, which is infinitely easier than trying to reach into the case oh. and do that, especially after... The system's installed. Oh, and the motherboard tray. It comes out. It's a totally removable motherboard tray that has its own set of feet. So that I've used one of those. Past. Yeah. I've used, it's, it's, like, awesome. <laughs> now, one one of the things about this that that kind of didn't make as much sense was the fact that when you, you put the motherboard tray back in, it's, mm -hmm. it's motherboard tray and expansion. This reminds me, I don't know if you remember the old... I know HP did this, but back in the late 90s, some of the OEMs were making these smaller form factor cases, and they were more modular internally. And I know with the HP Pavilion stuff, you could slide the motherboard tray out from the back, and it included all the expansion right. slots in one frame. This is similar to that. The Everything in this basically floats on some sort of rubber mount, and the motherboard tray is no exception. It's held in by nine screws, all nine of them 
have these rubber washers spacing them away from the metal frame. When you when you remove those nine screws, you can just pull the motherboard tray that comes out with the expansion bays all in one metal unit. Oh, nice. When you have that removed, not only can you build your system on that tray, but when you put it back in, you can reorient it. It can be an inverted layout or you can put it back to a standard layout and it basically lets you reverse the case once you've removed oh, that tray. interesting. Trace. Yeah. That's really slick. Oh, yeah. With, with with the glass side panel, with the way it's built, I didn't go any further into thinking maybe I could actually like rebuild the case completely the opposite way and make the glass panel on the opposite side. With As shipped, it makes sense to leave it in a standard orientation so you can see your components with the glass side panel, but mm -hmm. it, it's definitely unique to be able to remove the entire motherboard tray and right. basically the back of the case and then flip it upside down if you want to or just build your system on it if you want to. So stuff like that mixed like at, like the high quality of all the components in question, the, the, the touches like there are hard drive bays within the main component enclosure if you want them. It comes with one. The other two three and a half inch hard drive bays it has pre-installed that are down below under the, the PSU shroud out of sight. But you can add another five hard drives to the component chamber if you want to. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it comes with these pre-installed covers. So it gives it a very finished appearance instead of just having like five holes. Uh, nice. So things like that, that, that just made this a little bit more premium. And considering the fact that it's a limited edition, considering the fact that it has kind of a modular construction and, and it's made with aluminum panels and tempered glass panels and stuff like all of this could have added up, I think, to a higher price tag. This was being sold with an MSRP of 199 which in the very high-end world of cases is kind of like your entry point to 250 mm -hmm. uh, Aluminum would have, all aluminum would have been a lot more, I'm sure, but I've already been seeing this selling for a little bit less. They they were selling this officially through uh, Newegg for 189 So, I mean, nice. if you have that much to spend on a case, it's fantastic. It's It's lighter than you would expect i think the lighting implementation is great and you can of course turn it off you can manually control it from the front panel or you can hook it up to your motherboard and let your motherboard control the light but very good noise levels very good thermals uh filters were easy to access even things like the front panel which it pops off pretty easily just snaps into place there's no wire connecting the front panel to the case the, the way that it makes its connection for those RGB lights is just with a like a series of pads that press against really? the front panel it's installed. So it's like, you know, you've had oh, some of these cases. In the, yeah, you, <laughs> I've, I've done RGB cases where you pull off the front panel and then you realize you're yanking the RGB wiring out. Is it, you know, nothing to manage here. You just pull it out, put it back on. So just... Every every little thing about it, like I'm like, you know what? These be quiet. Apparently, whoever is designing their cases is similarly obsessive and a perfectionist, and I related to that throughout. I'm like, oh, good, they did this, they did that. So I was very pleased. I mean, one of my running jokes is that engineers to be should be forced to work with or on the products they engineer. So it sounds like in this case. You know, the, the engineers aren't ignoring, the, hey, you know, because if you've ever, you know, drawn blood on the back of your hand or had to adapt multiple devices to get to or, or you know, borrow a small child to get a screw in underneath some unfortunately overhanging ledge of a case or dealt with wiring issues or dealt with, it just sounds like it's, it's solidly engineered because we've seen some cases up in that near $200 level where it's like, oh, this is expensive and it's kind of stylish at least this month and it's built just as poorly as a $60 case. Um, and it seems like it was super quiet. Yeah. Noise levels were very low. We're talking like 33 decibels range mm -hmm. with normal work. And that's with a, a fairly quiet build. I mean, using that hyper 212 right. RGB edition cooler, which on an open test bench is like 38 and a half decibels inside of this case. We're talking, I think it was under 34. But so that's a pretty good very, cut noise. Yeah. It, 
I, I could be a little like you could you have control over noise versus airflow. It comes with three, two or three of the 140 millimeter fans pre-installed. And you have a fan control hub on the back that has a toggle on it to go between performance and silent mode. It ships in silent mode. Mm -hmm. And then you have a fan controller on the front that lets you choose between auto, which it has a PWM like fan header pass through. So your motherboard can control the fan speed. That's what I did. And yeah. just use the standard fan profile is how I got my temperature and noise results. But you can play around with this and you can get the fans going at full blast just by going up to like level three on the front fan selector. So oh, wow. you can choose between like airflow and noise on the fly. It just sounds, uh, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Very impressive. Oh my goodness. Uh, amongst the, uh, amongst the April fool's day mayhem this week, the data centric innovation day with the 56 core platinum 9200. Uh, was this an actual product or was this an April fool's joke? No, this is real. <laughs> they waited until okay. April 2nd to hold their event. So I guess, I guess until, you know, like everybody feels a little odd about posting news on the first, but they were holding this mm -hmm. event. Our own Jim Tannis was there managing editor for the site. And he had this very comprehensive write up. I couldn't find anything better on the web and of course i'm biased but the, the 9200 <laughs> the xeon platinum 9200 is just monstrous i think they actually used the word it's a beast on stage during the presentation but we're talking about a 400 watt part with you know 56 cores tremendous performance like they were doing some benchmarking right. on stage and had set a world record in something or other. And it's, it's, uh, I cannot remember what the price is. I want to say it's somewhere north of $10,000, possibly $17,000. Wow. <laughs> but hey, you know, if you want the ultimate performance. Well, this is also, we should point out, a server part, not necessarily something you're going to be throwing in your next gaming PC build. Although part of me is like, you know, like, gosh, how many cores is, you know, this app or this app or this app or this app capped at? Because that's one of the things that's been interesting is is realizing that in some cases an application can't actually take advantage of more than 12 or 16 or 10 cores, depending on the application. But, um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, 100 gigabits. I don't know. I almost feel like, you know, I'm like playing around with 10 gigabit Ethernet cards right now. And I'm like, ooh. And, you know, they're looking at 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, along with Optane memory on top of Optane SSDs. Um, this is, uh, you know, Intel making big iron. <laughs> yeah, they are. They, they had some other stuff to show off to uh, their Optane persistent memory. It was it was a very data center focused right. presentation. We're not going to be seeing uh desktop stuff probably until later i know amd of course is going to be making a push at you'd have to think they're going to be announcing stuff at computex that's been kind of the the word because lisa right. sue is going to be the the keynote presenter at computex in uh i believe that's in late may plus there's been the whole we'll be like seeing... seven 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 thing <laughs> Seven nanometer on the seventh day of the seventh month. Q John Lee Hooker guitar solo. Well, that's also, I mean, you know, speaking of AMD, uh, from the kind of Captain Obvious reporting standing, uh, and I actually don't mean to be mean when I say that, but uh, so there's a write-up on Digitimes. AMD to see sales increase sharply in second half of uh, 2019. Um, you know, in no small part, right, because they're launching the third generation Ryzen CPUs with the Zen 2 architecture, X570 chipsets, uh, to be unveiled yeah. at Computex 2019 at the end of May. And uh, so, you know, they've the been one, sort of down in the first quarter of 2019, but they expect it to be yeah. up in the second half. What was interesting to me about this, and like you said, it's pretty obvious, and we're all expecting those announcements at Computex, but I looked a little bit further down this write up at DigiTimes, and this is something I'd also heard, which was, and I'm quoting, because of Intel's CPU shortages, 
HP and Lenovo have been placing orders for AMD CPUs for their notebooks since the second half of 2018, while Asus Tech Computer has adopted AMD solutions for a couple of its gaming notebooks that have achieved better than expected sales. So, <laughs> like Acer, HP, Asus, uh, they're they're starting to show up in Chromebooks. So, just because of a shortage, a, a legitimate shortage of Intel CPUs, there are now going to be more and more products this year you're going to see that have an AMD CPU in them instead. And you're going to go into Best Buy and you're going to see a lot more things with AMD CPUs than you would have if Intel did not you know, have this problem with their current process and getting things up to uh, speed and yeah. out to the market. <laughs> well, so you know, I'm okay with AMD being in a position to make Intel work harder. Uh, and eventually sell us processors at a local cost because I am selfish that way. Um, Optane support to Pentium and Celeron processors. Uh, you found an article from Tom's Hardware on this. This seems kind of natural to me. Um, and also it seems a lot of the original positioning for, for Optane is less critical at most price points because SSD prices have been dropping. But, uh, you know, is is it surprising you know, a, a, on any level to find the Pentium and Celeron lines getting Optane memory support in the chipset? I don't think so. Not anymore. Not with the eighth, eighth generation series. It, Optane from the beginning, if you're not aware, was always a core product. It's like you had to have a core something CPU or you couldn't right. take advantage of it. They had basically disabled Pentium and Celeron support. Whether, you know, obvi obviously this is product segmentation and that sort of thing. And it makes a lot of sense for some of those lower end systems to me. Like this is a very natural thing. You mm -hmm. you have a combination of spinning storage or actually I think starting with the, the launch of the 32 gigabyte Optane, there was uh, SSD support as well. You could combine mm -hmm. like a, a slower large capacity SSD with Optane and have a much faster experience with the large storage footprint. And Enabling it for Pentium and Celeron, which they apparently did somewhere near the beginning of March. We didn't find out about this. Tom's didn't have this report up until the 29th. And the version of their rapid storage technology driver 17.2 had actually launched. The latest version launched at the beginning of March. But in the actual release notes, it just sort of casually mentions that it requires 8th generation systems and it specifically lists uh, Pentium and Celeron processors as, as being extended, like the support has been extended to them. So they didn't make any kind of press release or anything about this. It just sort of showed up. And for people who have some of those more budget-minded Intel systems and bought a, you know, a Celeron or a Pentium, just kind of nice to have that option. But it's going to be completely dependent on your motherboard manufacturer. It's going to have to be enabled in, bio, in like the BIOS so we may see relatively soon some BIOS updates come down that just extend the support because previously it had been locked unless the motherboard detected uh, like a Core i3 or Core i5 processor. So as as long as the motherboard updates come down, this is a great thing. Otherwise, it's just going to kind of be a next gen thing, like ninth generation boards that come out with Optane support built in for the lower. As long end. as they actually deliver the support they promise to deliver to support the thing you think <laughs> you're buying. Um, not that we've heard that before. Uh, so I think everybody was kind of fascinated, uh, shocked, horrified, delighted, amazed, uh, covetous. Uh, there were all sorts of reactions cr pretty much all across the emotional spectrum. Uh, but if you're a gamer, um, especially leaning towards the sort of like I'm a serious esports kind of person and I need all of the power, but I hate carrying my case around with me. Alienware's uh, Area 51M was one of the big announcements at CES this year. Um, Dan Seifert over at The Verge. Uh, got uh, got hands on with it, and one that's been uh, I was kind of giggling because on one hand they confirmed everything we knew about the Alienware Area 51, which is that it's it's desktop. You can upgrade the CPU, you can upgrade the GPU. Uh, two power adapters on this, uh, or as they point out, two large power adapters on this one, um, and it is. Uh, you know, I, I like how he puts this uh, portable in only the most literal sense, uh, meaning that, you know, this is a big, hefty machine. Now, um, 
you know, this is, it's, you know, it, first of all, it's starting at 1950. Uh, and if you max it out, it will easily hit the $5,000 range, uh, which is kind of amazingly expensive uh, for a computer uh, even these days. But looking at the configurations, um, for one thing, it's fun. If you, if you go on Dell's uh, configuration page, one of the things to do is select your game to see frames per second. And at the, the Alienware Area 51, uh, the entry-level you know, $1,949 version has a Core i7-8700, 8 uh, gigabytes of RAM, an RTX 2060, and again, that 17.3-inch display. And that's, uh, that's 190 frames per second and VR-ready uh, at Fortnite. And if you go to the... $2,800 configuration, which is the next jump up. You're getting 16 gigs of RAM, an RTX 2070, uh, and then you bump up to a ninth generation in core, uh, Intel Core i7 9700K with an RTX 2070, 16 gigs of RAM. That's getting you to $3,250 for the $4,049. For a i9 9900K, 16 gigs of RAM, and an RTX 2080, and if you have all of the money for five thousand one hundred forty-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, uh, three hundred ten frames per second on Fortnite, uh, according to their their little box there, um, sixty-four gigabytes uh, seems to be listed as the memory on that. But uh, a Core i9 9900K, RTX 2080, um, sixty-four gigabytes of RAM. It is a beast. It also would be a monster, amazing, extraordinary. I mean, four 16 gigabyte DDR4 sticks inside of that thing, two terabyte, uh, two two terabyte RAID zero, uh, which is actually a one terabyte, you know, RAID. Me at a uh, two one terabyte drives. Oh no, they're actually are they doing RAID zero? That's crazy, death rate. Um, and then a one uh, terabyte hybrid drive inside of there. So that is an kind of a ridiculous machine. And you know, if you bought a desktop. Um, you would probably be in the sub, you know, I want to say $3,500 range for that same thing, but you also, of course, wouldn't get it in the relatively transportable enclosure. Um, Definitely have you know. bragging rights with this thing. This yeah. is uh, one of those, you know, uh, 144 hertz, 17.3 inch 1080p display. Um, the color they're calling Lunar Light. And just for fun, going from Fortnite to. Battlefield 5, you go for, to 160 frames per second on the $5,000 version. And 100, well, they're saying 120 frames per second on the, uh, the entry-level model. But will it play Crisis? They don't say. And for that I matter, will always, it play Doom? I always want to ask, does anyone use Crisis outside of running benchmarks? <laughs> Did they ever? That's the big question. I guess there were people who actually played the game. I think in this industry, it was just used as a GPU benchmark for like four or five years. I mean, it, it does also help them if they're running 1080p on that 17-inch monitor, which is completely appropriate given the size of it. But, uh, you know, even at 144 frames per second, they don't need all of the GPU to keep that thing fed. But uh, it is a big beast and i i keep looking through this and i can't find did they put the actual weight on it? okay it is over 8.5 pounds 1.7 inches at its thickest point um now i'm old enough to remember when a sub five pound sub two inch laptop uh was still a big deal and that was when laptops still had trackballs inside of them but uh the power adapters, I guess they get up to the, I, I assume they get up to the 300 watt power supply uh, or the 330 watt power supplies, uh, one of which I do not have within arm's reach, but, you know, they look massive if you've never carried around one of those with a gaming machine. But I'm guessing it's probably three or four pounds of power supplies with this once you get the machine uh, topped out. But if it, you've been it waiting. Amazes me that it, it amazes me that they're using two power supplies, but I assume that's because one is for like, the Intel graphics and the other one is for when the GPU kicks in. I don't know I why you separate them. Well, I mean, it may just simply be a, a wattage issue, right? Because you got a what's the what's an RTX 2080 plus a Core i9 9900 draw? Um, in yeah. theory, and then it depends on which version of the 2080 they're using. I'm assuming this is not the lower wattage version. So. I just think it's funny. Like you, you end up walking. If you go into a coffee shop with this thing, it's gonna look like 
obviously you can relate to having a dedicated headphone amplifier strapped to your either digital audio player or phone. Right. And here you're going to have two batteries strapped to each other. And then you need to find two outlets. But it's they're bringing back the luggable category. That's what I think. No, I mean, as somebody who literally carried a sewing machine PC in his early days, uh, it, it feels familiar but much nicer. I mean, if you think about it, a desktop RTX is, what, topping out at 225 watts. You got 95 watts for a 9900K. Um, you know, and the most powerful power supplies we've seen, or, or the biggest power supplies we've seen that they're shipping with gaming laptops are usually top out at about 300 watts or 330 watts, which gives you... Uh, I would not want to run, you know, by five thousand dollar gaming system off of a single three hundred and thirty watt power supply because that would give you, uh, that would give you, uh, well, it, it wouldn't even feed the twenty eighty at max power consumption, the the ninety nine hundred K and the and the power supply or and the ninety nine hundred K and the RTX twenty eighty unless the RTX twenty eighty is consuming. Uh, you know, okay, the RTX 20, well, no, but this isn't the laptop version, the RTX 2080. I keep, I keep trying to tell myself, no, it's only 150 watts because it's the, no, <laughs> it's not the mobile version of the RTX 2080. So if you've been waiting, it's here for you. But you may be wondering how you're going to afford your $5,000 gaming laptop. And this brings me to a wonderful moment. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Gazelle the trusted online marketplace for buying certified pre-owned devices. If you've never been up to Gazelle, um, it's really cool. Uh, you know, you've, if, if, you're, if it's time to upgrade, right, you know, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, okay, the kids need new tablets or you want to get something for the family or yourself or if you've got like, okay, I'm a creative, I'm professional, I need a better camera in my phone, I want a better device, I want a nicer MacBook, I want an iPad – uh, that'll do what I want it to do. Um, you should really take a look at Gazelle, right? They they grade everything, fair, good, or excellent condition. I can verify that Gazelle does a pretty good job of you know kind of sorting how things should be and getting a decent price for you. iPhone six through ten, a variety of Samsung Galaxy phones, uh, MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros, standard Air and Pro iPads. They do like a 30-point inspection, and they back everything they sell with a 30-day return policy with no restocking fee, free shipping, so that if something shows up and it's not so good, you got 30 days to figure that out and send it back to them without spending any of your own money on that return. All the products are sold without a carrier contract. They're available for support by major carriers or unlocked. Gazelle has made sure the device is free and clear for you to use. Excel has an incredible selection of quality pre-owned devices. They're an excellent choice for students because, you know, money needs to be saved. And if you don't know what to do with your old devices, go to Gazelle for competitive offers on your used phones, tablets, or computers. Level up this year with new tech from Gazelle. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. That's gazelle.com slash twit. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Twit and This Week in Computer Hardware. I uh, I wanted to I wanted to add this in uh, uh, just because one to give a shout out to Hard OCP uh, and two because we were talking about power supplies on uh, I had a viewer question on Tech Thing this week asking about a power supply recommendation because the guy's got coil wine it's driving him nuts and we talked about coil wine and we talked about 80 plus certification and how generally speaking, you know, the certification is great because the more efficient your power supply is, the less heat it generates, the longer it's going to last. And I was talking about how I always try to buy at this point, you know, I've bought, uh, you know, there's, for example, you know, Corsair CXs don't necessarily deal well with torture test benchmarking, you know, compared to some of the Seasonic or other brands out there. Uh, EVGA has some pretty fantastic power supplies. Um, go to PCPro.com, read the reviews. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, but the uh, the the crew over at Hard OCP, they're they're posting a bunch of stuff before the site. It's arc well the site goes away right and one of the things they did have been doing uh, is doing reviews of power supplies that are 10 years old and this I found fascinating uh, uh, Paul Johnson wrote this up uh, it was one of the last thing Kyle edited before he went off to Intel and uh, uh, you know they're literally they this is I guess they've done two or three of these and I think it's really cool to look at 
a piece of hardware, it's like, oh, well, it says it's going to last this long. It will, we will guarantee it for 10 years. And part of what was interesting is uh, uh, they've done like the Silverstone Olympia 1000 watt, the Cooler Master Real Power Pro 1000 watt, which uh, were not able to perform as well, uh, did not pass the tests. Uh, after 10 years, uh, the Seasonic X750 did. Um, they also point out, uh, quote, it did not do as well as it did 10 years ago. The voltage regulation was a bit looser than what we saw initially on the 12-volt, 5-volt, and 3.3-volt rails. Uh, but it's really impressive that it was still able to pass all of their testing, even if it was 10 years old. So, um, you know, something to... Uh, you know, something that's worth uh, kicking over uh, to take a look at Hard OCP before Hard OCP goes down. And also a shout out to everybody over at Hard OCP for all the amazing work over the years. Um, you will be missed. Uh, but uh, I love the fact that they're taking a look at a hardware that's 10 years old and then benchmarking it and seeing how it holds up uh, at the end of its warranted life. Um, and I, I know people who have been using the same power supplies for three or four builds. And in most cases, you probably might want to think about upgrading that power supply before the next build. <laughs> um, they, that was uh, a power supply that was in regular use for 10 years. It wasn't just like they yeah. took an old review sample they had benchmarked once upon a time. Absolutely. And, like you it said, like a little bit looser, but still within tolerance levels and performed well enough to still be quite a viable, a viable power supply now 10 years later, which is kind of I think that's a long time, and then I realized that ten years ago was two thousand nine, and I'm sure I have, <laughs> I have components that old or older laying around here. So it's still pretty impressive. Um, often goes around and see what the oldest power supply I currently have running is right now. You, uh, I was, I, I like this case you found. It's an Indiegogo launch, um, the Century Two Point console sized computer case. Is this an actual? super slim full ATX case or is that an ITX case? I believe it's ITX and it's unforgivable that I can't answer that because I actually have it about 15 feet away from me right now. Quick, so, run and get it. Run and get it. <laughs> I'll read yeah, off the I'll, specs when you go get it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's still in the box. I, I received one to review and I haven't gotten started on it yet. My apologies Jealous. to them, but they just started the Indiegogo campaign on the 1st. And I looked last night when I posted news about this, and after about two, two and a half days, they're over a third of the way to their goal. So yeah. the Century, okay. the first one was massively overfunded. Like, they, it was very popular. All the major tech YouTubers uh, have done stories on this, have videos on this. And this is the new version, which it's. it reminds me of, like the one of the first cases I ever reviewed was actually the N case M1, which was this all aluminum, super small mini ITX crowdfunded case that has kind of been a benchmark until probably until the Dan cases A4. Uh, both of them were made by Leanne Lee, all aluminum designs. This is not uh, the same idea. This is basically it kind of, especially the lighter colored one, it looks kind of like an Xbox mm -hmm. One, but. It's just giving you a chance of like continuing on with the sort of the the legacy that was going to be like the steam machine, and they sort of abandoned that. But you can still right. get one of these cases, build your own either Linux or Windows powered console with full size components, and you have some options. Like it uses one of those uh, very small uh, SFX power supplies. You can put a full-length graphics card in it, or you can use a shorter graphics card, like one of those sort of mini ITX size graphics cards, and put additional mm -hmm. storage in it. So you do have some options, and there's options in the way that you actually have it mounted, vertical, horizontal, all that kind of stuff, just like with a a console. So it's very cool looking, and I'm going to get to that next. That'll be my next case on the test bench. That'll be awesome one. It's uh, two hundred sixty dollars, but it's it's. Uh... I think pretty reasonable for a pretty stylish custom case. I love that they managed to uh, get USB slots in the front of the case, having played around with a bunch of, of relatively slim enclosures. Things like that are incredibly useful and often not included. Um, 
supposed to be shipping in December 29 or excuse me, yeah, December 2019. So that would be a way out. But uh, one, it's awesome that they already basically have the cases. You know, they have demos of the cases that have gone out to a bunch of people. Uh, yeah. You included. I want to give a shout out to one of my favorites, the Skyreach 4 Mini, um, which I have all of my parts for this, including the crazy DC to DC power supply. Um, but this is my next mini ITX enclosure build. And I did uh, the older brother of this uh, case, I guess almost about two years ago now. Um, these sell for $199. And uh, they cannot fit a full-size GPU inside of them, but it's amazing how many sub 250 millimeter or sub 200, yeah, 250 millimeter or shorter GPUs are available these days. Um, what they do is, uh, what they do is, uh, they amass orders and then place them. Oh, I thought it was still available, but I guess it is going to. They're going to look at it again in May. My apologies. I thought that was still available, um, but uh, you know, the. Uh, it's nice to uh, it's nice to see some of the really stylish uh, stuff that's out there. Josh Sniffen uh, designed and engineered that case, and he does some really nice work. And uh, I'm really curious to see what you have to say about the Century 2.0. I'm also really curious how quiet or loud it is, because um, one of the downsides of having a relatively small case is you don't really have any ability. <laughs> you, you can have cooling. Um, or you can have quiet, but it's tough to do both quiet and cooling. Um, you also yeah. need very, very short coolers on your CPU, uh, which is not too that's, bad these days, but occasionally is a little yeah. crazy. And that's usually where you run into a little bit more noise too, because you go to one of mm -hmm. these really low profile coolers. And then if, especially if you're using a higher end CPU, you're having to use much higher RPMs and it's usually a smaller fan. Not always. Right. I have, I have some options around here, thankfully. So I'm going to pick the the lowest profile cooler with the biggest fan that will fit and then see if I can get like 120 millimeter fan going kind of slow and keep the noise levels down. But I, I do really like the idea of going horizontal with these because I really like the thin mini ITX standard, but it's not very practical. It was the last generation of boards that still had like a by four PCIe connector on them. And you could use a 90 degree angle adapter and certain thin mini ITX cases allowed you to use a full-size expansion slot, but then you were limited in bandwidth, so GPUs were not really possible. You could do like a high-end sound card or some other kind of capture card, but taking that up a little bit in, in height and then allowing you to use full-size GPUs and then mini ITX motherboards, which let you put in a similar 90-degree connector, put in a full-size GPU or a small GPU, so you're getting back into that territory of some of those steam machines or like the Alienware had one of these smaller form factor systems. I don't know if they still do. It was one of their Area 51 models that used like a small GPU. It was like sideways inside the case. So it's just cool to be able to build it yourself. Of course, the cost will is prohibitive to a certain extent, but you have to remember these are custom made cases like the Skyreach you talked about and the Century 2.0, they're they're making them to order essentially they're ordering them yeah. from an OEM and, and well, smaller they're, batches so you know they're they're not that much more expensive than some of the cases we've seen but yeah this is to give you an idea of what a CPU cooler for that would look like um the one you're probably like for example if you decide to get the uh the Noctua the one they do now they have a larger radiator on it uh the same size fan um but it's kind of crazy how small a CPU cooler can get. Um, you know, not going to be as efficient, not as overclocking friendly by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but this ends up being 37 millimeters, including the fan. So there's uh, not a lot of size to this thing. And if I put it in front of my face, it actually focuses on this instead of my face. So uh, I've actually been surprised at how good the performance is. Um, I'll be curious whether or not I can overclock an 1800X with that uh, with that on it. <laughs> I suspect it will not. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm going to say probably not, Patrick. I'm sorry, but you know, maybe if you go 38 adventure? millimeters, maybe even 39. Do you have space for 39 millimeters? <laughs> what we need is a really tiny liquid cooler. Um, the uh, I want to give a shout out. Uh, 
I first heard these headphones uh, at Can Jam last summer, and these are Monoprice's 565C. They're uh, a closed back planar magnetic headphones. Uh, Laura Dragon over at the Wire Cutter picked these as the best sort of everyday audiophile headphone. And these are, I got to give a shout out because he's got a pair of these in. And so you can see just inside of there, you can see the actual, that's the actual. Uh, you know, the sort of the diaphragm for the planar magnetic inside of there. Um, the build quality is not as, uh, it's fine in some sense, in most of the time. Like if you get really annoyed with things like, oh, they didn't quite center the screw below that, you know, the, 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 the stick on Velcro that holds the ear pads on, um, these might drive you insane. Uh, but I gotta say these, the performance on these and the fit on these is fantastic for $200. Um, I also want to give a shout out. Uh, you know, these are like the base on these is phenomenal. Um, really, really good detail in the signal. Hey, this is a really, really nice value, especially if you've been curious about planar magnetic headphones, which tend to be a lot more expensive. Uh, and unlike some of the other less expensive planar magnetics I've heard, uh, these don't fall apart in the sub base. The lower base doesn't disappear. They don't sort of fall off at 40 Hertz. Um, Really, really impressed with these. And uh, also, if you want to have, if you're looking to upgrade your headphones, you don't want to spend a ton of money, um, I really got to give a shout out to kind of one of the best headphones out there, probably the best headphone out there for the money, uh, Sony's MDR7506. If you're really curious what your music sounds like, if you're looking for like, I want to, I want to upgrade my audio, but I don't want to spend a lot of money, um, these typically sell for $75 or $80 off of Amazon. Uh, you can hammer tent pegs with them. Um, I've seen these in recording studios in New York City. We used to use these all over in the editing stations at Revision 3. Um, you know, uh, th this was something that was picked out as being a particularly neutral headphone by one of the most legendary and mythical speaker designers ever, Mr. Dunlavy. And uh, it's, uh, you got to spend a couple hundred bucks before you get something that sounds particularly better than this. Not the most stylish headphone, not a detachable uh, headphone cable, which is kind of irritating, but these are extraordinarily good for the money and you know if you want to if you want to like i if you want to sort of set a baseline for what your audio should sound like you know upgrade to spotify premium get yourself a title account rip your cd collection uh play your video games uh, but do it through this, and it, it will give you a really, a really good, solid idea of what your music can sound like, and what's there. And then it gives you something to compare when you listen to, you know, more expensive headphones, or you start listening to speakers. It's nice to give yourself sort of a, a level start, at a, you know. And these are about, that's about the best headphone you're going to find for under $150. Uh, also, very, very comfortable, at least until you know August, and it's incredibly sweaty gaming weather. But. Uh, just want to give a shout out on those Monoprice 565Cs. Those are really, really good. Um, you can do better, but you're going to spend a lot more money. Um, just wanted to shout that. Shout you out could, that. You could really, you could say that about audio gear in general. This is the, the thing I know we've talked about before, where <laughs> when you get up into the high end, and it's all, it's, it's, it can be debilitating. You can be, and I know some of us would think like if you had unlimited money, then of course, how could that be a problem? But really, you become <laughs> so overwhelmed by choice, you would chase yeah. perfection for the rest of your life trying to find the next better thing up the chain and spend untold amounts of money because up into the very high end, it just it seems like the pricing makes retail jewelry seem reasonable with a low markup <laughs> because you can get into hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred dollars, yeah. three hundred thousand dollar sets of components and speaker cables that cost more than a car but yeah there's a lot of come down to the also, low end go ahead oh no i was gonna say there's also there's so much um mystical um bull fluff also i think at, 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 a, at a lot of the high end there's there's a point where it's become in some cases fashion and in some cases um i don't know i i, I get really frustrated um by the way some of these products are marketed and i get really shocked because i've heard you know i, I heard a set of speakers i'm like oh, those are a hundred thousand dollar speakers and they sound like crap and you know then i heard down the hallway at ces uh, from Ravel some pretty extraordinary speakers which were twenty five thousand dollars which is more than i'm ever going to pay for a pair of speakers but it was like this is a phenomenal audio experience uh and what blew my mind was the hundred thousand dollar speakers that sounded like crap were actually $400,000 speakers. Um, 
Yeah. Um, you know, now maybe it was a, maybe it was an issue with the room. Maybe it was an issue with the source material. Uh, you know, but it was like one of those moments where, you know, there's probably thirty, forty thousand dollars of amplification in that room and it was beautiful, right? Yeah, everything was polished copper and there was all sorts of amazing awesomeness and it was, it was aesthetically beautiful and they had, you know, little, things, tripody things to hold the speaker cables up off the floor so that, you know, yeah. the earth's whatever doesn't interfere with the electrons moving through the speaker cables. And the speaker cables were literally thicker. The copper in the speaker cables was literally thicker than the stuff I use for the astonishing amount of amperage it takes to start my Cummins diesel truck. Um, you know, this is, this is cable that would be like seven, eight, nine, twelve dollars a foot. Uh, even if it, you know, came off of the rack uh, at, at your local, you know, uh, well, if you had a hardware store that stocked that kind of stuff. Uh, and these were, you know, I think hand-knitted Bavarian wonder cables that were covered with, you know, uh, you know, virgin. It was just, it was, everything was like insane and over the top. And the cabinet work on the, on these speakers were amazing. But I was just like, wow, you know, there's not much in the way of highs. There's not much in the way of bass. And this is a really unimpressive speaker. Uh, and then it becomes really unimpressive when you realize the price. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, you and I both, uh, have nerded out extensively on speakers. Uh, uh, and for me, of course, uh, headphones, uh, in, uh, it's certainly something you can kind of change, chase a little bit better, a little bit better. Uh, you know, there are people who I, I know who have cheerfully spent four thousand dollars for a set of the headphones, uh, and then in a few years, because they have the disposable income and they're obsessed, they they may spend four thousand dollars again for the next level of the most amazing headphone ever. Uh, I like looking at the bargain stuff. Um, some of the bargain yeah. stuff doesn't sound so cheap, you know, Mr. Speaker's, uh, you know, uh, Aeon's. They're like eight hundred dollars a pair, but you got to spend two or three thousand dollars to get something that is any kind of an improvement, or possibly even the equal of it, a couple grand. So, value is relative? Question <laughs> mark. It's the it's the classic like diminishing returns thing. Like, yeah, you can put a hundred dollars into a pair of headphones, like those Sony's, actually less than a hundred dollars, right. and get so close to the next step, which might be three hundred dollars ahead of it. Right. That it becomes very difficult to like it's it's easier to have a, a hard price limit. If I had no more than one hundred dollars to spend, then I can be happy getting the best hundred dollar headphones I can find for my taste, whether that's an extremely neutral sound or like a lot of bass or whatever. But when you have ten thousand dollars to spend, then it becomes right. very difficult to pick it up. And they're different, you know, sonic characteristics of different headphones and then just everything promises to be better because of, you know, X, Y, or Z, or the functionality maybe gives way to the style of it at some point, and then you just get lost. But give me an $80 pair of headphones and like a $200 digital audio player, and as long as I only had $300 to spend, I can be happy <laughs> that I got like the best I could probably get for $300. But yeah, it's good to be limited sometimes. It certainly makes the decision... Uh process or the the number of options somewhat more narrower than you think in a positive way if so uh, <laughs> pardon me my phone's exploding um i'm apparently trying to swallow my own tongue but uh let me take a moment to thank uh express vpn this episode of this week computer hardware brought to you by express vpn Everybody thinks, you know, cybercrime, hacker attacks, mayhem, uh, cracking, attacking, theft is what it comes down to. Is It's something that happens to other people, right? You, you may think no one wants your data, but maybe you work for a big company or maybe you are, you know, an inventor or something. You may think the hackers can't grab your passwords or your credit card details. They shouldn't be able to, um, you know, but you'd be kind of wrong. Uh Stealing data from unsuspecting people on public Wi-Fi is alarmingly simple. Now, it's gotten harder, right? We have HTTPS now. Most websites are HTTPS. Most websites are properly encrypted. It's a lot better than it used to be back in the day. You know, in most cases, you connect to a website to do your, your business, and, and things are fairly solid in the sense that things are fairly private. Things are secure. But some websites, not so good. And what's worse yet, 
is at some point there may be some new crack, some new flaw, some new security problem. And, you know, maybe somebody in the coffee shop is taking advantage of that. Maybe they're doing a man in the middle attack. Maybe they've got some sophisticated hack that they picked up somewhere and they're using it on your connection because you're connected to public Wi-Fi, which is why I use a tool, ExpressVPN, to secure and anonymize my internet browsing. It encrypts all the data, hides my public IP address, you know, it doesn't matter if it's if you're worried about hotel Wi-Fi or somebody in the coffee shop, or maybe you're just tired of your ISP throttling certain things you do on the internet. By using a VPN like ExpressVPN, you can protect yourself. ExpressVPN is really easy. If you can click a button, you can use ExpressVPN. Easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, your phone, your tablet. You can safely surf on public Wi-Fi. You don't have to worry about being snooped on. And for less than seven bucks a month, you can get the same ExpressVPN protection that I use. ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by Tech Radar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Do yourself a favor. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash twitch. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for three extra months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash twitch to learn more. Just encrypt your packets. Make sure your connection is secure and, uh, you know, if you're doing things that maybe you don't want your ISP to know about, you know, a VPN comes in useful there. And ExpressVPN, solid, solid performance. And I appreciate that. Oh, my goodness. Project Loon. I wanted to talk about this in the worst possible way. Um, I should say, watch out, Project Loon. <laughs> so Project Loon, right, is the sort of like, you know, giant balloons, the giant internet balloon project that, that Google was talking about. Um, there's a story up on GeekWire uh, that came out uh, this morning. And the time, I'm just going to read the title. Amazon to offer broadband access from orbit with 3,236 satellite Project Kuiper Constellation. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so what I did know is I guess last September, uh, Amazon announced that it was it was planning a big audacious space project. And uh, now Amazon's got a ton of money to spend, and this is an interesting place to spend it because when you start looking around at, at what's going on in this area, the I'm going to get my internet from space area, um, OneWeb just raised over a billion dollars. Uh, SpaceX uh, has been talking about their Starlink system. And there's a... Uh, there's a link you should take a look at if you want to see something crazy. Um, you know the the early proposal uh, uh, for for SpaceX. So they were talking about like up to one million Starlink satellite Earth uh, stations, and uh, all I could think of was the sort of opening to Wally, uh, where you see the ten thousand billion pieces of space debris wrapped around yeah. the Earth. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, so Amazon's talking about 3,236 satellites, 784 satellites at an altitude of 367 miles, uh, another just under 1,300 satellites uh, at 380 miles, and another 1,000, 1,156, yeah, well, not 1,000 or 1,156 satellites at 391 miles. And uh, GeekWire uh, asked uh Amazon, if, if Kuiper Systems is one of their projects. And Amazon said, Project Kuiper is a new initiative to launch a constellation of low-Earth orbit satellites that will provide low-latency, high-speed broadband connectivity to unserved and underserved communities around the world. This is a long-term project that envisions serving tens of millions of people who lack basic access to broadband internet. We look forward to partnering on this initiative with companies that share this common vision. Uh, and pretty much everything from 56 degrees north to 56 degrees south, basically 95% of the world's population. Um, so this is, uh, this is interesting. And they do a nice summary. I'll, I'll point you to geekwire.com uh, to read the full article. Um, but they kind of do a summary of what's going on with SpaceX, OneWeb, Telesat, uh, and, uh, and LeoSat in terms of all the sort of space internet. And this is not... We're not talking about the stuff that's available now where it's like $6 a megabyte and you have, you know, the crazy portable panel and you can feel like, you know, you're in Wired magazine in 1996. Um, 
I'm really kind of curious uh, where this ends up and how's it going. No, no idea what costs are going to be, no timeline, no official dates. Um, but if you currently enjoy the fact that there are places on the surface of the planet you can get to uh, and not have people send you email, that list may be getting shorter <laughs> in the next few years if all of these companies uh, manage to pull off what they're trying to pull off. So I just find that fascinating. I also just may have massive nerd issues. Yeah, I love that IEEE Spectrum article. SpaceX confident about its Starlink constellation for satellite internet. Others, not so much. And they're talking about a 12,000 satellite array. And uh, if you haven't read up on that, I'll just say search for Starlink SpaceX and prepare to be fascinated. Because um, it's, uh, it's interesting, the theory they're running on there. Oh my goodness. PC Per, anything you can uh, tease that's coming up on PC Per this week? Well, apparently April is enclosure month here at PC Perspective. And uh, I've already had, I think, two enclosure reviews wrapped up in the last week. I've got another one coming. I have to get to that Century 2.0 we talked about. So get as many cases done as I can until the <laughs> inevitable onslaught of CPUs and motherboards in the summer post Computex. So. That's what you can look forward to probably in the near future, along with, you know, the odd keyboard headset and uh, maybe a motherboard to throw it in there. Oh, my goodness. Shannon was super excited this week on Tech Things. She, uh, she got flown as a brand ambassador down to Phoenix, luxurious Phoenix, Arizona. I actually like Phoenix. I'm not trying to m mock it. I'm just kind of was giggling because, you know... Uh, <laughs> It's, just, it's not it's, even that long of a flight from you guys either. No, so. no, it's not. But uh, they flew her down and, and she got to ride in the, some of the Waymo taxis down there. And I am a little, it's interesting because one of the rumors is, oh, maybe Waymo's getting ready for an IPO. But they've definitely in the last few months turned up the, the profile on their self-driving uh, vehicle efforts. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's interesting to read articles by people who are not living the, you know, Waymo lifestyle, but are living uh, with Waymo vehicles in their neighborhood. I also think about it a lot because uh, Cruise has a ton of vehicles wandering around San Francisco in the evenings. And it's always interesting to see what I'm pretty 98% sure is two engineers inside of this vehicle with, covered with sensors wandering through the city. Uh, uh -huh educating their, their, their vehicles as fast as they can. Uh, the other thing was uh, an odd April Fool's announcement that is not an April Fool's announcement was uh, Cloudflare uh, is going to be adding a free VPN to their 1.1.1 app for iOS and um, Android. And uh, it's uh, if uh, you were thinking about installing that right now it is just uh, essentially a one-button app that turns your DNS a resolver over to a Cloudflare's 1.1.1 service, whether you're on iOS or Android, and they will be slowly rolling out warp in the future. Uh, I think, I don't know if, if in, it, whether or not you'll, your browsing will be faster using uh, their DNS server. Uh, it will, it will do things like you will not be getting advertising, it will not be tracked. It is encrypted so your ISP can't follow what you're doing. But for me, what's most interesting is they're suggesting that if you have issues when uh, you're kind of moving between your wireless internet and your Wi-Fi, your mobile provider and your ISP, uh, having a single DNS on your phone binding those two together or serving both those two might actually make that experience less irritating. So I've been playing around with that one. And the the jury is still out. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see how long warp takes and what the performance looks like when it is available. Because that's a lot of data to move for free. Because there's a lot of Android devices out there. And there's, you know, significantly less, but still a lot of iOS devices out there too. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. If this is your first episode, ladies and gentlemen, this is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show about hardware. <laughs> we didn't talk about consoles this week, but we do that. But mostly we talk about desktops and laptops and phones and the Internet of Stuff and all of the things you might be able to do with that, and which one you should buy and how you should buy it and how to fix it and how to make it faster because we like fast things that cost less money because parents... We also like fast things that are just fast things because geeks. And uh, if you've never been here before, do yourself a favor. Head over to twit.tv slash twitch. You get information on how to subscribe to the 
how to survive, how to subscribe to the audio <laughs> podcast, the video podcast, uh, on pretty much anything you might want to watch it on. You can watch the episodes directly on the webpage. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. Catch you next week on Twitch.